I said six chapter verse eight is what I want to read. I'm going to work from one down to eight, possibly in the context. Time allotting. Isaiah 6 and verse 8. I'm going to get it right from the King James. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I. Send me. Is the word of the prophet Isaiah. I'm going to continue with the thought of a fresh experience with God. A fresh experience with God. Spending time with God each day and reading his word and going through the scriptures and prayer, uh, that builds up your spiritual awakening for time with God. Also, it awakens you to a spiritual ear to be attentive to the audible voice of God. I've never heard God audibly speak, Clinton. Some have and had the experience of that audible voice. But I have experienced many times how his word speaks out of that Bible and speaks to me as if it was written, written in that very moment. But however, it's my ears tuned to hear what God is saying, reading the scriptures, prayer, and spending time with God. As I do this, I let God speak to my heart and I wait for his instructions. Because God will move you in some ways that you, you'll come back and say, oh, no, that ain't God. Again, be God. It usually goes against your flesh and your will and your desire when he's telling you to do something that you just don't want to do. Watch this. Bless them that curse you. I don't know. I got I to gotta wait. I got to wait on that one. I don't know. If that, I, I believe in James Brown scripture, the big pay. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> So wait on God and follow his instructions. So here's Isaiah in these scriptures of Isaiah, the sixth chapter, verse one through nine. The prophet here is being refreshed as he encounters the Lord. And he says that in the verse one through four, something about in the year the king Isaiah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the, temp on, on the throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. My good friend and pastor brother Rick Campbell wrecked this text in a good way. He can preach this text over and over again. So, Soup, if you're watching, I'm going to just breeze through it and get to my point. But the king Isaiah was a very uh, 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 wicked king. He was a corrupt king. And uh, God is him with leprosy, and he wound up dying from that. But his badness reflects God's goodness to be the rightful king of kings. His incorruption brought about the eternal king, which is the king of glory. So Isaiah says, when this corruption died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Listen, if you don't get nothing else, some things that are not good in your life have to die out of your life for you to see the Lord. You will never be a clear picture of him because you're being blocked and obscured by an Uzzi, a corrupt king. When he died, he says, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, train filled the temple. Above it stood in verse two to four, the seraphims and the seraphims. Each one had six wings and with twain they covered their face, with twain they covered their feet and with twain they did fly. And one cried out to another saying, holy, holy, holy. The Lord of hosts, the earth is filled with his glory. He saw here Isaiah vision, the eagle eye prophet, and he sees these these cherubims covering their faces. They did not want to be seen, covering their naked parts. They wanted to see the Lord high and lifted up. They did not want him to see their faces. He said, the glory was so strong in the house that the posts of the doors moved and the voice of one of him that cried and, and the house was filled with smoke. He said, it was so powerful in this vision that it was an radiance of God filling the place. The pillars in the temple were moving. When the prophet Isaiah encountered God, he saw this but yet he saw his own ruins in verse five. He says, I'm undone. I'm in the presence of God. You never come into the real presence of God and see yourself all of that. When you get into the real presence of God, you see yourself unclean, unrighteous, unholy, because his light shines bright on you. He says in here in verse five through seven, he says, then he says, uh, uh, the servants here said one to another, having a living, the servants, sorry, in verse five through seven, took a living coal off of, of the altar and came and touched Isaiah's mouth, his lips. And he, put, he took the coal from the altar and came and touched his lip and laid it on his mouth and said, lo, this had touched my lips and thine iniquity is taken away and thy sins are purged. This hot cold, this vision is that something is now cleansing me. 
like a hot coal from a fire, touching my lips and taking away the bad and letting good come out, changing my language and my mouth and my, my utterance, I would speak now the things of God. That clothing fire was like the clothing tongues of the Holy Ghost. You can't get touched by the Holy Ghost and still keep talking crazy. Once you get touched by the Holy Ghost, your whole language change. Came to this clear understanding that he really did God in his life. And when God touched him, our text says, he says, then here am I. Verse 8, send me, I'll go. Never had a man answer so quickly to the Lord's call. Moses argued for days and said, get somebody else. Gideon says, I can't do this job. Clinton said, you can't be talking about me. But Isaiah said, here am I, send me, I'll go. The task was difficult that he had to take, but he decided to take it on. This experience with God that we look for and we want to have, it comes through a move of God in our lives. Israel had to be preached to and understood that they were out of step with God with rebellion. So Isaiah, you're going to go preach to them. They're going to have ears, not hear you. They're going to listen, but not obey you. They're going to do everything to give you attention, but they're not going to do what I'm asking you to tell them to do until they come to the place of where they were going into captivity, into difficult times. And then in the last verse of that sixth chapter, it says, a tenth of them will come back out. Isn't this something that I won't hear God until I get in trouble? When I know, that, I know that things are really rough right now. Your neighbor had a prayer that they prayed. Look at me. Don't, don't read. Look up, look up. They had a prayer that they prayed when they were in that storm. They never told you about. But that was a prayer. <clears throat> Everybody in the house heard it because they were going through. Didn't pray like that when things were going well. But when things got tough, you prayed like somebody was whooping you. You prayed with everything within you. God, if you get me out of this. I promise I'll be the loudest person in church. Y'all yeah, hold on. I'm talking to this group right here. You had that prayer. Let me see if you had that prayer. That prayer. That prayer. That prayer. And no one can pray that prayer but you. But as soon as things get a little better, you start remembering the experience with God. So you need a fresh experience with God. Jumping out of Isaiah on into the book in the 43rd chapter, what does God say about a new experience? I'm moving out of the sixth chapter. I'm coming back to it. I'm going to chapter 43. Here's what God says about a fresh experience. In verse 18, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? Do you not see it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wilderness. I want you to know that God moves fast. And you got to keep up. Don't catch up. Keep up. God through the prophet Isaiah was telling us that we have the ability to place the past behind us. We are capable to utilizing the bruises and the experiences, but we got to forget them and move on putting them behind us. I can attest, as many of you in here this morning, that it's not easy to forget the trips and the tours and the adventures that we've been on. They're readily, readily in our minds, but we must keep moving forward. We must act upon them and remember them unless we become paralyzed by the future or are not going to the future. You get stuck in the same place. The general overview here in this text of Isaiah 43, the general ideal here of dealing with the past, it takes three things. It's emotionally, it's spiritually, and it's relationshiply. If I'm going to deal with my past, forgetting those things emotionally, my thoughts and my feelings can carry me away. 2 Corinthians 10 and 5, he says, we cast down these imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. I have to get my thoughts and emotions under control. I've been in a place where I was an emotional wreck. Didn't know what to do. Your whole interior is just paralyzed with anxiety. And you wonder, how do I get past this? You're waiting for the final blow to wipe you out. And God begins to speak to you until you bring your emotions in. 
I have not given you the spirit of fear, but I've given you power, love, and a sound mind. You bring yourself in. You have the ability to grab yourself up in the shirt. Tell yourself, sit yourself down somewhere, acting like you crazy, like the sky is falling apart. God is taking you through a fresh experience. When you come out this time, you're going to come out praising and thanking God that what the enemy meant for evil, God meant it for good. Spiritually, I must understand my position in God, 1 John 4 and 4. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You must learn how to understand the Holy Spirit dwells in you and you have power. Power that you have not tapped into yet. But it takes pressure to bring out that power. It takes a stronger instrument to awaken you to who you really are. If you were in a place and seen a person that was demonically or spiritually confused, you would pray, Lord, bless them. But if that demon got near your baby, you rebuke everything in the house. I bind you, I send you back to the pit of hell, Satan, the Lord of it. It's a different prayer you pray because it's in your house and you stop it at the door. Spiritually, you must understand who you are. And lastly, relationshiply. Considering who I'm around, considering who I'm connected to, We're connected to the wrong person could be a deadly thing, tragic in your life. Concerning the way that I'm connected to two, to two things, how that connection takes place. Amos 3 and 3 says it like this, can two walk together except they be agreed? You can't walk with someone unless you're in the same cadence or moving in the same direction, going to the same place of victory. What you stay connected to will affect you in a positive or a negative way. You are the sum total of the relationships that you keep. Hang around broke people. Somebody in my circle got to have some money. I can't be hanging, I'm not negatively talking, I'm saying I can't keep hanging around with defeated people and think I'm gonna get some victory. When we meet, the first thing we say, how's it going? I wanna find somebody that I can meet and say, God is good, God is doing wonderful things. I'm on the come up and the come back. But every time I meet this same person, they're talking about, oh me, oh my. Relationship lead. You are the sum total of the relationship that you keep. Bad influences will create and cor bad habits, and bad habits are hard to break. I'm going to have a better experience with God in my life. I'm going to go to a greater height in God in my life. I'm going to look for a brighter future with God in my life. I must deal with my emotions. I, would deal, I must deal with my spirituality and deal with my relationships that are around me. Remember not, he says, the form of things, although there are times we must recollect on things that have gone past. And we must glean from those things with wisdom, but do not stay there. Do not expect past victories or stay around past victories and cause your life not to keep moving. Remember Gideon in Genesis 6, Gideon says it like this. He said, the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said unto him in Judges 6 and 12, and said to him, the Lord is with you, your mighty man of valor, mighty person of strength. God saw strength in Gideon when he didn't see it in himself. And Gideon says, okay, I, I see what you're saying to me, but he goes on in verse 13, he says, but, but, but Lord, the Lord is with me, mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, then why are all this happening to us? Has anybody got that feeling? Why is all this happening to me? And where are all the miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Remember not the former things. 
didn't remember it, and he made, heard the story, and he knew the history of them coming out of Egypt. But God now is taking him to a fresh experience. He's going to learn God on a whole nother level. There's no natural, natural, there's no natural question here that God delivered them. It's, it's clear that God delivered the nation from bondage at the right time. We're all in dilemmas from time to times and points of views, wondering why we're we in this place now. If this is to be so, why am I in all this now? Where are all the miracles that our fathers told us about? Why have thou forsaken us and these Midianites are coming up to destroy us? I'm going to teach you a fresh experience. When God teaches, he often makes sure that he balances out your need to need him more. The answer to the question here that God has forsaken him, I'm not forsaking you. Israel, you walked away from me. So here comes now the judgment that is due because you did not do what I asked you to do. Plainly put it, you're not going to financial debt. You just put your mind on the wrong things. You did not handle yourself as a steward to take care of what you needed to take care of. Now, God, why is all this happening? I was not a manager of what God gave me. <laughs> Gideon reads this move, Clinton, and, he, and Gideon's talking to this story, and this story ends with victory in Gideon's life. But God told Gideon, I'm going to reduce your army down from 32,000 to 300. Reduce the number down, and Gideon says, now this is going to be a real big experience. Because I thought for sure with the 3,200, I can get, 32,000, I'm sorry, I can get the job done. But now you brought me all the way down to 200. God will back you up to where you know you ain't got nobody to depend on but me. I, I want to make sure that you're going to call me before you call anybody else. I want to be your favorite friend. Brought the number down to 300 to fight, but, but the, then God says, you're going to do this unconventional. What do you mean? He says, I want you to get a pitcher, get a lamp, put it inside it, get a trumpet. And when I tell you, bust the pitcher, let the light shine out, and blow the trumpet, you're going to get victory. God, you've got to be kidding me. I mean, you have any better warfare, warfare, tactical warfare than this? No, this is what you're going to do. And they did it, and God gave them the victory. Many nights killed themselves from the shining light and the blowing of the trumpet. They didn't know where the enemy was at, and God gave Gideon the victory. Adding to the escape from Egypt, now they see that they whooped the Midianites. The one text says the Midianites covered the grounds like grasshoppers. They were everywhere. Could not see the ground because they were so strong, but God gave Gideon a fresh experience. See, the past is a great place to be and to look and a great place to learn from, but it is not to stay there. You must move on with your life. What does the Bible say about having an encounter with God? I like Luke's text, the 10th chapter in verse 17. Lord, even the demons are subject to your name, Luke 17, 10, 17. And he says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I've given you the authority to trample over serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemies and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. I'm going to show you an experience. I'm going to let you understand that the demons cannot overpower you. Remembering that I am the source of your power. The lightning of Satan coming down means he's already been defeated. He's going down as quick as a split. I have delegated authority to you through my name. Snakes and scorpions and venomous enemies will not harm you. Over all the power of Satan, I've given you the authority. Nevertheless, rejoice in that your name is written in heaven. My name is on high, but it took the experience of what I went through for me to understand the joy of God bringing me through it. See, when you encounter God, you're going to encounter on your path to a way to joy. Peace and love and strength as you encounter him. These are the good things that God speaks to us about. An encounter with me brings joy. In the same context of Luke 10, around verse 21 and verse 17, they rejoice with joy. So joy therein is a feeling, Luke 10, 17. It's a feeling and an expression. You encounter me and you're going to have some joy and an expression sooner or later. As they rejoice 
He said, don't rejoice over that. Get happy about your name. A joyful, I'm sorry, that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Luke 10 and 21, the Bible says, and Jesus rejoiced and was filled with joy in the spirit. I know some of you don't like all this joy stuff. And you don't want to get too happy to show an expression. But when you think about the snakes and the scorpions and the demons that God has rescued you from, nobody has to know what's been chasing your life. Sooner or later, an expression has to come out. Oh, come on, don't look too hard. Get a little happy because it did not break into your house. They broke into the house next door. And in the house next door, the police had to come in and kill the man because he was about to kill the man and the woman. So when our house was delivered from the man that wanted to get in our house, went to the house next door, I knew then that it must have been some blood covered over this house and a prayer. This is true. Now, I come to church and y'all want to just sit there all you want to. But when your deliverance come, your neighbor is not out there. I wonder, what did you make it through? Come on, Sister Sheila, tell me about it. Come on, Sister Connie, tell me about it. When I should have caught the bullet, but the bullet went past me. When I shouldn't have made it out from the harm's way, anybody in it been delivered, give God a deliverance. Uh, shake one neighbor's hand. I'm going to the clothes say, you're going to get a fresh experience. You're going to see God move to add to your history to let you know I'm not through with you yet. There is something greater inside of you that's going to make you holler and give thanks like never before. Oh, 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 oh. This ain't the end, baby girl. I got some joy coming. And the joy that I have, the world didn't give it and the world can't take it away. Hallelujah. Some holler joy. Joy is the expression of unspeakable things. It's unspeakable joy and full of glory. The glory that Isaiah saw in the church. Glory, glory that Isaiah saw in the church. This glory begins to shine out of the believer. A light begins to burst through in your life because you realize God brought you out safe one more time. When you should have stopped right there, but you live to see another day. And if I live to see another day, I promise you God's going to get his praise. The world didn't give it to you. In the world, he says you're going to have tribulations. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I have got victory over everything in your world and concerning the world. I am your Super Bowl. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That's not my note. I am your winner. I am the greatest thing that have happened in your life. If you're going to cheer, cheer Jesus. If you're going to praise, praise Jesus. If you're going to shout, shout Jesus. If you got to then holler Jesus. Spiritual. A fresh experience with God. Spiritually. To get spiritually refreshed, you must read this word. You must believe this word. You must find it refreshing to your soul. Spiritual refreshing means by self, that selflessness that I'm going after God as the deer pants for water. You must understand spiritual refreshing is taking over of yourself, taking authority over yourself and bringing yourself into prayer with God. Spiritual refreshing is to pray. And there is a refreshing in the power of prayer. When I saw him high and lifted up, I knew then I was on my way to another level in God. You have to see God higher than your circumstance, above your problems, and lift it up, and let the train fill the temple, and let the posts begin to rock. Let smoke come in the atmosphere, and where there's smoke, there is... Yeah, preach a little bit. And it fires in the building. Jeremiah said it's shut up in my bones. It's a joy that I cannot quench. I cannot shut down or put out. It's a joy that's contagious. You might be sitting next to a joyful believer that believe God to do greater. Any joyful believers in the house this morning, wave at your neighbor and say, neighbor, 
I'm going to a new level because that's just what God does. My fresh experience will give me fresh oil, fresh oil, fresh anointing, fresh power, fresh peace, fresh glory, fresh income. My God, freshing like rivers of water and streams in the desert. Shake one neighbor's hand and say, neighbor, this is a new experience with God. And I'm coming out on top, better, stronger, wiser, no lack, power, victory, glory, in the name of Jesus.